The teachers this morning are going to love this first story. A few years ago, a San Francisco school district pulled off an ingenious experiment. Three teachers were selected for this pilot program, and they were told, you are the best that we have. We're going to give you 90 high IQ students. We want you to move at the student's pace, and we'll see how much they learn in a year. Now, by the end of that year, those selected students had achieved 20 to 30 percent more than the rest of the school district. The principal then called those three same teachers back into his office and he confessed, you didn't have high IQ students. They were just run-of-the-mill students. Still, the teachers felt pretty good about the results. And then the principal continued, I have another confession. You were not the best teachers we had. Your names were the first three names out of the hat. So the obvious question is, if both the students and the teachers were average, how did they achieve above average results? And the answer is the power of as if. German poet and playwright Johann Wolfgang von Goethe said, treat a man as he is, and he will remain as he is. Treat a man as he should be, and he will become as he can and should be. And no one modeled this better than Jesus. Now the Pharisees, they just treated people as they were, and then decided to limit whether they could come into, into synagogue or not. Whereas Jesus treated people as they could be. Which makes sense, because no one would know our God-given potential better than the one who gave it to us. Just consider the nicknames that Jesus gave his disciples. Peter was so impetuous, and yet Jesus called him the rock. James and John were mama's boys, but Jesus called them the sons of thunder. James was the first disciple to be martyred, and John lived the longest and wrote both the Gospel of John and Revelation. By today's standards, Saul would be considered a terrorist for the devastation that he inflicted on those first followers of Jesus. But, he had an encounter with Christ that blinded him. He eventually regained his eyesight, but he never saw the world the same again. As the Apostle Paul, he saw how the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, God's Spirit could work in people and transform them, helping them reach their full potential. The letter to the Romans, which includes this morning's message, is Paul's longest letter. It is also considered the most commanding and the most inspirational explanation of the salvation of the gospel of grace, the gospel of salvation by grace ever written. Back in chapter 7, which we did not read today, Paul argued that for each of us, the Sin is a power stronger than our own wills to do good. It's particularly stronger than the good required to do Torah law. In other words, God gave us the law so that we would have guidelines for behavior, so that we could be a better community. But on our own, sin overpowers our will to do good, and we do what is not good. We become like slaves to sin. We can't fulfill the law, and we end up misusing it in ways that break down community. Paul said, I can will what is right, 
but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but the sin that dwells within me. And yet, we are no longer helpless. Through the life and death and resurrection of Christ, we are no longer condemned to sin and death. We have been given the power of God's Spirit, which can work in us to empower us to do what is good and right. The Holy Spirit is mentioned a dozen times in this morning's passage. It says we live according to the Spirit. Our minds are set on the Spirit. We are in the Spirit. The Spirit is in us. The Spirit is life. Therefore, as verse 12 states, we have an obligation to live as if we have the Spirit and are led by the Spirit. Mark Batterson, the author of the book If, which inspired this whole sermon series, notes that our minds do not discriminate between what is real and what is imagined, which is why hope, or living as if, gives us so much potential. Don't get me wrong, we are all sinners in need of a savior, but we are also more than conquerors when we live as if God is for us, as if the Spirit is in us. Those two little words, as if, bridge the gap between our if-only regrets and our what-if possibilities. It's the way we define our circumstances. It's the way that God's promises become our reality. In verse 6, Paul warns, to set the mind on flesh is death, but set the mind on spirit, it's life and peace. Our battle, though, isn't between mind and body. Paul is in no way suggesting that our bodies are bad, but we can be aware of the focus of our thoughts. We have response ability. Responsibility doesn't just mean taking the blame or credit. It also means being accountable for our responses. There's an old acronym for fear, F-E-A-R, fear. False expectations appearing real. Fear gives weight to things that don't deserve it. It drags us down. It holds us back. Faith is the exact opposite. It's being sure of what we hoped for. It liberates us to live into our potential. If we tie our emotions to our circumstances, they're going to look like a seismograph, jumping up and down with every tremor and shudder in, around us, in and around us. But if they are tied to the cross, it becomes our fixed point of peace and hope. The first 11 verses of Romans speak about what God has done for us. And then verse 12 begins the section which states what God expects of us. Since through Christ, we are in the Spirit, or the Spirit dwells in us. We have a debt or an obligation to live according to that Spirit. <clears throat> obligation. That's a word that we don't like very much. It kind of carries a negative tone in our culture. But what if we saw it not only as something that we have to do, but as something that we get to do? What if an obligation is an opportunity, the opportunity to live into our God-given potential? Think about the obligation of marriage. I have not had two people come to, to, in front of me for marriage 
that were not filled with joyful anticipation. They want to spend their lives together. When two people love each other, it is a joy to work together. It is a joy to support each other. There is pleasure in helping your spouse be happy and healthy. Our covenant relationship with God is similar, but so much more. As humans, we often think of that weight of being legally and morally bound to God, but God is legally and morally bound to us. God is better than us. When our love strays, God's love remains steadfast. God is for us always. The gospel demands that we give all of ourselves to God, but when we do, God gives all of God's self to us. I realize that some people here today listening feel dragged down by life. It's hard to feel loved by God when your heart is full of grief. It's difficult to feel saved by Christ when you are battling addictions and compulsions. It is tough to feel the Spirit lifting you up when your bills are piling up and you are sinking into debt. And yet I encourage you to keep walking by faith. Keep just taking one small step after another as if you feel the Spirit. Try to keep in step with the Spirit until you get where God's Spirit is taking you anyway. John Wesley's first mission trip to the United States was a whopping failure. On the way back home to England, his ship sailed into a storm. And as it rocked, Back and forth, back and forth, there was a group of passengers who were Moravian Christians, and they gathered to sing and pray. Unlike Wesley, they remained calm throughout the storm. Seeing their faith made him doubt his own. Later, when he was back on dry land, he asked his Moravian friend, Peter Bowler, how can I preach if I don't have faith myself? And Bowler replied, preach faith until you have faith, and then, because you have it, you will preach it. Wesley did just that. It took him a while. It took many small steps of faith. It took reading the scriptures and ministering to others and listening to other people's experience of the Spirit before he, too, felt his heart strangely warmed one evening during a Bible study on Romans. He finally felt God's assurance that he was loved, that Christ had died for him, that he was also a child of God. Preaching faith until we have it doesn't make us hypocrites, as long as we do it in the right spirit. On the contrary, it makes us fellow disciples with flaws that others can relate to. Think about that. No one wants to be instructed by someone who isn't secure enough to risk letting their students' faith <coughs> surpass their own. I listen to many people as they struggle with life. And this week I heard someone say, I just don't have the energy to be optimistic. That's okay too. There are rough days. And the Spirit will be right there beside you, walking through it with you. When your life feels off script, 
turn to scripture. Read the day's passage or have someone else read it to you. Turn to the Psalms and let those ancient words be your prayer. Words have the power to lift our souls. Batterson says he reads the Bible daily, and his goal isn't just to get through the Bible, it's to get the Bible through him. In my experience, during the tough times, it also helps to release control and all of our burdens to go. My nana used to say, let go and let God. As we let go and cry, Abba, Daddy, Papa, Father God, the Spirit bears witness. It, it confirms, it cries assurance with us that we are a beloved child of God. And as you stay open to the Spirit, you will be surprised at the people and the blessing that God sends you. Some would call them fortunate coincidences, but I call them <coughs> God moments. I believe that God orders our steps, not just when we walk across the stage for graduation or up the aisle for marriage, but every step. We certainly can take missteps, but I marvel at God's ability to arrange divine appointments along the way. I'd like to end today by returning to a few key verses from this morning's scripture, but this time from Eugene Peterson's The Message. But if God himself has taken up residence in your life, you can hardly be thinking more of yourself than of him. Anyone, of course, who is not welcomed the invisible but clearly present God into the Spirit of Christ, won't know what we're talking about. But for you who welcome him in whom he dwells, even though you still experience the limitations of sin, you yourself experience life on God's terms. It stands to reason, doesn't it? that if the alive and ever-present God who raised Jesus from the dead moves into your life, he'll do the same thing in you that he did in Jesus, bringing you alive to himself. When God lives and breathes in you, as he does, as surely as he did in Jesus, you are delivered from that dead life. With his spirit living in you, your body is as alive as Christ. This resurrection life you receive from God is not a timid, <coughs> grave-tending life. It is adventurously expected. Greeting God with a childlike, what's next, Papa? God's spirit touches our spirits and confirms who we really are. We know who he is, and we know who we are, father and children. Amen. Go and live today as if you have the power of the Spirit, as if the Spirit lives in you.